if before COVID, um, hybrid work was an absolute dream and it would love to have it and it would be so happy if it was part of the contract these days is almost like a given from candidates they are actively expecting when you speak to them no matter the level all the way from graduates to seniors they want to have some certain flexibility and they want to have a hybrid working policy it doesn't matter if it's four days in the office versus one at home or three versus two but that is um some of the candidates already assume it's going to be there and that's the direct impact or consequence from what we've experienced with the pandemic. Um, now, what are the advantages and disadvantages? Obviously, where you are based, it's absolutely essential. If, if, you, if you work on a site, I'm, I'm guessing you live nearby. Um, the good thing about hybrid working is you, you can live two, three hours away potentially from an office if you're only going once a week or twice a week, if you are committed enough to do the travel. So that's a really good thing. Um, the disadvantage is that um, I would say disadvantages. Also, there's a positive um, factor in it as well. Clients started to require can, uh, their employees to come back to work more than what it used to be, let's say, in the beginning of the year. So even if, if we still have the hybrid policy, um, it mostly applies to everyone. Uh, the big organizations out there, um, they are now requiring to have people more in the office just to come back to the same positive team atmosphere and just work together, especially in the new programs or new te technologies where they're building things now. It's absolutely essential to just have that teamwork at the core of what, what they do. Um, the next topic is diverse workforce and inclusivity. This is really interesting. We we actually have uh, dedicated a lot of time in Thomas Store to this because it's, it's what people talk about the most these days. Um, when we refer to diversity, we don't only refer to race and gender. So that was uh, in the past. <laughs> we refer very much to background, education, um, marital status, age. So very many things would make you a diverse candidate or would make you different than your colleague and or your um, your, your friends out there. What we're seeing um, in the industry and what are the things happening from a client perspective, which is really positive, actually. Um, there's a really big push on upskilling the middle age group. Um, as you're all very aware, there are a lot of subject matter experts, people who've been in the industry for 20, 30 years, and then there are a lot of fresh graduates um, or juniors entering the industry now or having a few years of experience. But we do have a problem with the mid age group, the 30 to 40 year people, which um, they do have a more difficult time because there hasn't been such a big push on upskilling them. It's much more expensive for an organization to hire external talent rather than focusing really on upskilling what they've already have internally. So now there's a big push from everyone across the world to upskill that certain age group because that will be very positive. Um, then on the other hand, uh, we are seeing more and more, I can obviously talk on behalf of France as well, UK and also Europe, uh, the rest of Europe, um, most likely the self-identification forms will be included. What do they mean? It's just an anonymized form that is asking you for your ethnicity, age group, um, nationality, gender. Um, it will always be anonymized. It will always be most likely part of a survey, but the, the clients do have to start to really record this data and really analyzing their shortlists. We need to have obviously a diverse workforce, workforce moving forward and um, this will be the direct first um, action that the companies will take and they've already started actually. Uh, moving on to the next uh, to the next topic is Brexit. Um, how did Brexit impact the nuclear industry in Europe? Um, Quite significantly, to be perfectly honest, I am myself Romanian originally and slightly bit Italian as well uh, from my father. So I'm an immigrant living in the UK for the past 10 years. So I know really well how this works. Um, we used to have such a nice flow of talent between UK and Europe, um, and it was awesome to see people going back and forth, not only to Europe, but also to other countries like the UAE. You know, United States and so on and, and so forth. Brexit unfortunately blocked the flow of talent as much as it used to be. Right now, um, to come to the UK, for example, or to go to Europe as a British citizen. So either way, you would need a work permit and you will need to be sponsored by your employee. In the UK, the 
companies that are sponsoring, they need to get a license, which is often um, not a costly process, but it's often a very lengthy process, lots of bureaucracy, uh, and not everyone is willing to take the, the steps. The positive note on this is because there are so many new programs being launched at the moment in SMRs, AMRs and Fusion, um, employers really started to think of we really need to open our doors again. We need to get the license sponsorship and we need to really go out there and attract the Europeans because there is such a strong workforce in Europe that actually right now the UK is missing on. And it's a big uh, problem for us as uh, obviously recruiters because we have to look in just one, one single country, one kingdom, rather than exploring obviously the whole Europe and the best people out there. So, um, the tendency or what we are seeing already is most likely all the employers or the big programs will have to open up to Europeans in the next um, two, three years more and more. Um, so that's obviously a, re a really good consequence. Um, the last um, thing I wanted to tackle on, um, the last two things, are obviously, um, how how does the market feel like at the moment? It, it, it It's a very, very candid river market, I would say, um, meaning that there are very many um, people looking for roles, either changing their roles or entering the industry or actually shifting from other industries to nuclear. Um, it's really good for employers because they can choose from a variety of talents. Uh, for all of you who are looking for a role right now, it can be positive because there hasn't been, there, ne there never hasn't been such an opportunity for you to choose between so many programs. It's probably one of the best times to actually look for roles or start a role in the nuclear sector, but also it can be slightly more competitive. Um, if you are, let's say, a mechanical, ECNI, electrical engineer or civil, everyone will need these people, so the competition will be much higher right now. But if you are specialized thermohydraulic or chemist or obviously nuclear physicist, then obviously your your chances will be much, much higher because there are less roles, but less, less people that are doing that on the market at the moment. Um, the new areas of expertise in the nuclear sector, so very particular to nuclear, is digital transformation. Uh, we are seeing more and more investment and money being put um, towards digital transformation. Right now, most of the companies have hired their top leads on this, so the managers, the directors, the program leaders, and those people will start obviously building their teams up and hiring people underneath. So if you're thinking to make a shift or if you don't know what to do in the nuclear sector, this is a really good shout. You will very much be needed and you are needed right now. Um, also, configuration management goes hand in hand. It's really needed at the moment and it's a new, it's a, it's, it's a new area of expertise that will be very trendy, let's say, moving um, forward. Um, and to wrap up our presentation, um, we've decided to include some industry observations as well. Um, there is, a, as you all know, especially from COP27 and uh, what's happening in the world, uh, there is a growing climate and energy security debate. Um, there is a wider public acceptance and political will about nuclear energy, which is great. It does change, it, it does change things um, significantly and in a very positive way. So what does it mean actually in real life um, or in reality? There's an increasing innovation. There are a lot more governments and countries um, allocating investment towards the new programs. Um, not only the governments, but also private investors and obviously equity firms that are choosing to invest in nuclear because they think that's the right way to move forward uh, for what we need in terms of energy um, in the next few in the next few years. There are more and more advocates for nuclear from environmental activists and scientific community. I was very pleased to, um, to see so many NGOs and um, small organizations out there when I was doing a bit of work for COP. It's just very nice to see that all these people that have no connection with nuclear directly are not scientists necessarily. They are just very much in the field of supporting nuclear uh, and uh, making sure it goes to everyone, even to those that are against it. Even those people have 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 turned in the meantime. We are we are seeing that on the market. Um, transferable skills. Um, there are a lot of people who are carrying out their expertise from other industries into the nuclear space. Ourselves, we are happy to consider people from um, commercial power uh, plant space, aerospace, rails and defense. They are often 
sectors that are very much um, needed and clients will be more than happy to take people from all those industries and nuclearize them. We have a saying in the UK, we can easily nuclearize a person, meaning that if you have the right experience, learning the nuclear way won't take long and uh, you will learn a lot on the job, being on the job. Um, and there's an increased interest from students to study nuclear engineering and similar degrees. It has been mentioned from, from by a couple of people already today that uh, many more people choose to study nuclear engineering and uh, other similar degrees. I've had a pleasant surprise um, a few months ago when I was at an event to see people that literally they have nothing to do with nuclear. They had a completely different career and now they just want to shift. They want to actually go and study being 40 plus year old because they really want to to step in this industry and make a difference, which is once again um, a really positive, surprising fact. Um, how I would like to wrap this up is it's really positive. There are very many changes. Um, we are living in a very good, exciting industry, but the challenge is now to take all those concrete, uh, to take all those policy aspirations and actually have concrete actions that will turn all these ideas into nuclear power plants, operating ones, and also prolong the lifetime of the existing facilities, just to make sure we will have the energy supply needed moving forward. Thank you very much. And that was us. Thank you very much, Anelia and Daria. That was very, very uh, insightful and uh, very comprehensive presentation about the trends, about the different fields. And, and I think it's it's also important what you what you were saying about the uh, easily being nuclearized. Uh, we are here actually, of course, with our uh, within our nuclear bubble. Most of us here listening to are probably from the nuclear sector or are interested in nuclear sector. But I think it's also interesting for for the recruiters and for this uh, for the nuclear sector as such that the skills are there uh, in uh, cross sectoral uh, organizations and and I think it's it's important to pass this message also to the um, employees who are in the conventional power plants um, dealing with fossil fuels that that the job in nuclear is there and it's easy to be to be reskilled uh, for this job. Um, so thank you very much uh, for this. Uh, I don't see many questions. <laughs> I hope for to have a bit more than than only one. Evshen Novak from from Resh, I think uh, we know each other from Resh from Czech Republic uh, was asking you actually how do you work? How do you process? How do you find the candidates and uh, do you have any um, how do you measure also your success? Uh, so I think there are three different questions in, in the chat. Um, but first, maybe uh, I wanted to, to ask you um, about, the, you mentioned also the incre in, uh, increased interest. Um, where does it come from? Because I, I don't know if we can speak already about the nuclear renaissance, but uh, it's what are the factors that are impacting now the students uh, uh, choice actually in your opinion just I think um, seeing all these new programs being launched seeing that the government is actively supporting them um, as well as seeing all the billionaires out there really investing their funds towards nuclear because they can invest them in anything else right they can go to tech um, but the majority of them they they chose to invest in nuclear um, I think if I would be a student studying nuclear engineering, I would be very happy to be honest. <laughs> uh, but I think I would see my career path as being really, it's really promising. Um, this is not short term. This is very much long term. Um, all these new programs will still take five to 10 years and then they will be decommissioned much sooner, but then new SMRs, AMRs will be built. So it's so much potential that you as a student or as a grad, you are seeing yourself working, I can work in SMRs and MRs, I can work in fusion, I can work in decommissioning, I can work in drug waste. There's there are so many places and it's often that people change and experience the different parts of the industry. And I, we always encourage them. Don't just, especially if you're a fresh starter, don't set your path and say, I, I just want to do SMRs because they are trendy and everyone talks about them. Maybe you want to experience the different sides. And maybe having a bit of decommissioning experience, for example, would really help or the other way around. So I think it's just seeing all these actions, all these, um, even the initiatives from COP27 and the governments, what they are doing, 
it just tells everyone that it's the right time to start studying this uh, or get a role in the nuclear industry or change to this industry. OK, thank you very much. Um, Efsen puts uh, one question, the second, I mean, the, which is a, a bit more uh, condensed, I think. So what are the steps to use your services? Uh, how the candidates uh, or potential candidates can contact you and what is the, the process? Is this, uh, I, please explain this. Thank you. Shall I answer this one, maybe, Daria? Yeah, feel free. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's it's a two way approach. Of course, people sometimes approach us uh, directly. Uh, of course, uh, we have our contact details on one of the slides in case you'd like to reach out personally. Um, obviously, um, how our service works is, of course, uh, also targeting uh, depending on the clients. So uh, we have uh, a lot of strong relationships with a wide variety of clients across uh, the world. Um, of course, Daria and myself are more in Europe, but indeed we have uh, access to that network of clients, uh, but it also depends on the client need. Um, we do have sometimes the option to do like a proactive send out, um, but this is kind of depending on the expertise of the person. Um, indeed, uh, how, how we work and, and how we do our job, uh, we, we do have obviously a wide network of, of candidates. So having, you know, like a reach out saying, hey, I'm looking for this, I'm looking for that. Uh, it can only help. <laughs> um, it, it cannot really hurt to say, hey, I'm looking for something to somebody who, who has a knowledge of, of a lot of jobs. Um, but indeed, of course, it depends on how we can help. Uh, if somebody uh, tells me, um, hey, I'm looking for uh, a job in Australia, if I don't have any client in Australia, that will be difficult for me to support with. Um, but it could be sometimes that there is not really a live job or not really a job that has been advertised. Maybe it's something confidential or maybe something that um, is not officially live, but we have heard about that we can maybe proactively uh, send the CV. So it really depends. Um, I must say that a lot of our expert expertise is uh, uh, with more senior, um, you know, like senior jobs. But every now and again, we have also the option with uh, more uh, junior uh, level positions as well so feel free to reach out okay thank you very much that's that's also very useful to uh to have this information so i have also one question about the security clearance uh to enter the nuclear jobs can you say uh, uh one word within one minute because we have a <laughs> short time <laughs> left uh sure that really depends uh, to be honest with you with the level of clearance and with the country and different countries have different levels of clearance uh so in short um uh, they would check for example, police records, things like that. And uh, sometimes it, your nationality could be a factor in terms of a particular country because of bilateral agreements and because of um, what the local government decides to be uh, eligible to give uh, access to secure information. Uh, so that really depends on case by case. Uh, on a more uh, defense oriented project, the clearance will be usually much higher. Same goes for uh, jobs that require dealing with fuel, um, for example, uranium enrichment, these kind of roles. Um, so it really depends. Uh, the security clearance is usually uh, lower for office jobs, but again, that really depends on a case-by-case -case basis and the client and country. Giovanni is asking about the employee satisfaction. Do you have uh, any statistics on this? <laughs> I can, uh, I think I can answer that. Uh, we don't have proper data to prove what I'm going to say now, <laughs> so you need to trust me on this, but um, people are, so there is a big portion of people who are saying, okay, I want to, for example, the people who are working in the MOD defense sector, because it's a bit more bureaucracy in what they do, and it's a bit more difficult to get their goals, and they are surrounded by all these regulations, they would say to us, I really want to go into the private sector and do SMRs, AMRs, maybe even fusion because things move faster and you don't have the government obviously on your back somehow in, in, in very simple words. Um, then it's the same thing with decommissioning. Um, there are people who spend 20 years doing decommissioning. They already know it by heart, how it works, what they can do, and they would just want to move to private sector because they think it's much more interesting. Uh, I have not, I don't think any of us has had a candidate or a chat that told us they those people want to leave the nuclear industry. I think most of my discussions are either 
continuing into the nuclear sector and having a different approach, trying something new or actually entering. I'm very pleased to say that most of my candidates from other sectors, which I've been focusing actually lately on, they all said, I, I, I'm I, actually loving nuclear just by you explaining me this in half an hour. And obviously then they go into their own research. So um, it's a very, very positive approach. However, it can slightly be different based on what kind of nuclear roles you have and in what kind of areas, what my colleague Anilia has mentioned in her first slide. Yeah. OK, um, I think that's that's it. So I see there is a very a lot of questions from from the same person. Um, there is one question from yeah, Efsen Novak is asking, uh, thanking you for your answers. Uh, so it's indeed maybe you can also drop an uh, email to Daria and Anelia. Fantastic that uh, that we had a few questions in our in our active uh, chat. So uh, thank you very much from my side for your uh, for your contribution to the celebration. And uh, yeah, we are staying in touch and you have to hear the contact details of, of Daria and Anelia to to ask further questions or just drop a CV. Who knows? Maybe there is a job, a dream job waiting for you. So thank you very much from my side. Bye bye. Thank you very much as well, Emilia. So the final point of the of our celebration is um, now the concluding remarks will go to Nicola Forgione, president of the Master in Nuclear Engineering at the University of Pisa. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> and uh, thank you, Emilia. So I have the honor and the responsibility to close this event, mm. but uh, I must tell you that uh, it's not easy for me to close a so interesting and wonderful event. But anyway, mm. we have Continue. to do to do it, this one, this work. And <laughs> first of all, anyway, I would like to say something. Uh, first of all, uh, let me thank all the attendees to this event, which uh, participated in celebrating this 80th anniversary of the first nuclear reactor criticality made by Fermi and uh, his uh, collaborators. Can, can you hear me? Yes, yes. OK. Uh, I am very happy that you are so many uh, that participated, and I think that there are many students. Uh, we are happy to have students uh, participating because they will be our future, the future for the peaceful use of uh, nuclear energy. Uh, this event gives us the possibility to remember important steps uh, and efforts made by our fathers, uh, past scientists, to have an energy source able to help meet energy demands with no greenhouse gas emissions or low uh, greenhouse gas emissions contributed in this way to reducing climate changes. But I also believe that uh, this event gave us the opportunity to fortify the relationships inside the scientific community operating in the nuclear technology field. At the end of this event, I would like to thank all the speakers, the moderators, the colleagues that performed the criticality tests in the laboratories. We are very grateful for their availability uh, and the support in, uh, organiz in organizing this, uh, this event. Without their support, you know, it would not have been possible to organize this exciting and wonderful event. So thank again to all of them. Um, before to close the event, uh, I would uh, like to thank uh, in a special way my colleague Walter Ambrosini that uh, from the University of Pisa side uh, really uh, organized, uh, contributed to organize this event. So uh, Walter, please switch on your camera and microphone. Yes. No, thank you very much. I must thank everybody for 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 cooperating and uh, especially um, Roberta uh, that led, uh, let's say so nicely, the, the meeting Emilia as well. So please uh, open uh, the, the cameras and uh, let's say let's thank everybody for uh, having cooperated to this uh, nice event. It was a collective effort. Emilia, please. Uh, please, Emilia, come. Yes. <laughs> Emilia. <laughs> I, I miss Emilia. Where is Emilia? Okay, the no, other one. So, somewhere. Okay. Okay. <laughs> thank somewhere you. Emilia should be. Okay, Emilia, you're there. <laughs> so. Uh, thank you very much. It was uh, a great day, I must say, that because uh, it started uh, this morning for me here in Milan with uh, the Laurea Honoris Causa of uh, Mariano Grossi. So it was a special day, a special 2nd of December of uh, 
2022. I believe that we will uh, remind that for uh, for a long time. Uh, and uh, and uh, sorry for 80 years. For 80 years is uh, <laughs> said it is okay. Gabriel, come here <laughs> because Gabriel is here in the same room with me. Hello. Uh, so yeah. Leon, <laughs> you see. So the idea that if uh, the next 80 years, but I'm not. I cannot guarantee I will be here. That's the point. <laughs> Gabriel, of course. <laughs> In the case of Gabriel, <laughs> there is no, <laughs> no doubt. In my case, okay, I cannot do that. Okay, thank you very much. It was a great day. It was a great, uh, let me say, initiative that you gave uh, the legs to, and uh, thank you very much. So we will, uh, we will do another time the same thing. Okay, I promise. <laughs> okay. Thank so you very much. At this point, thank you all. It's really time. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Robert. Time to close thank the event. Thank you. And uh, have a nice weekend and see you soon for uh, future events. OK, not okay. eight years. Uh, <laughs> OK, I have, a, I have just not a final slide evening. to share with you. Uh, let me see okay. if I can, if I can, uh, to please, share, please. I can share this. Uh, it's uh, difficult now. I have all, all the secret things. OK, it is just just that not, not so much. OK, thank you very much. See you again. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. You. See you. Bye. See you. Grazie. 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 No, no, no. We are, on, we are online, huh, guys. <laughs> no, no. You're perfect. Okay. Uh,